from Matthew's Gospel, the 25th chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five more talents. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Before I make any comment on this parable, I would like to suggest that when studying the parables, I believe that there is no one interpretation that could be described as utterly conclusive, no one point that the parables make. As a matter of fact, one particularly insightful theologian suggested that the parables do not exist to make a point at all. They're not so much pointed, but rather rounded, so to speak. The parables come round to tell us about ourselves. The way in which we interpret them it tells us what we believe about God and about ourselves and our relationship with God. The parable I just read, familiar of course, is one of a trifecta of stories that the authors of Matthew portray Jesus telling shortly before he is arrested and crucified. The first of this trio of stories is the parable of the ten virgins, and it begins, the kingdom of heaven will be like. The word then presumably refers to Jesus' description of the end of the age in Matthew 24. I mentioned a moment ago that we have a tendency to look at the parables to try to understand their point. What's the moral of the story? What good advice might we glean from this story? And already, even before studying a single parable, we may see what that tendency says about us, about our desire to find a reliable moral compass, our perceived need for some sort of guidebook for life. Yet I would suggest the parables with what I would call their open-ended multiple interpretations exist more so that we may call into question our own understandings and presuppositions. More than us reading the parables, 
in many ways, the parable reads us. And in fact, the guide to our life, our compass, if you will, is not the parables, but rather Jesus himself. So this morning, I'd like to offer several possible interpretations, three to be specific, beginning with what I believe to be the most common, moving towards for what some might seem disturbing, again, in the hope of causing us to re-examine our spiritual assumptions and relationships. By the way, I will also add that the urgency and drama of this parable and the other two that surround it may potentially be accounted for by the fact that these stories are reported to have been told by Jesus just a few days before he was arrested and crucified. We find that Jesus is using language to light a fire under his hearers in order to quicken their understanding and to let them know the time is very short before they must begin to apply all that they have seen, and heard, and learned. So the most common interpretation, interestingly enough, often does not touch upon the last days at all. It simply suggests that if you have been given a great deal, a great deal shall be expected from you. And even if you have only a little, you should still do the best you can with it. Such interpretations often play upon the similarity between the monetary measure talent and the character trait of, of a talent, that is to say, being talented. What are your talents? Do you have many? Then use them for God's glory or for kingdom work. On the other hand, are your talents few or perhaps just one? Nonetheless, use them or it wisely, so as to yield a greater return. Now this is not at all a bad thought, not bad words to live by. Utilize those things that God has given you, return to the Lord, as it were, what the Lord has first given you. Unfortunately, when coupled with our spiritual understanding, the usual understanding, I should say, of the end of the age, that is to say, the end of the world of this present realm, it can take us directly into a place of works righteousness. If you did the right things with what you have been given, you will be rewarded, entering into your master's joy, so to speak. But if you didn't, if you did something so foolish as to bury your gift in the ground without letting it grow, well, then you will be punished by being cast into the outer darkness we sometimes presume to be hell. Somehow putting the common interpretation into context, it doesn't sound very compassionate when we think about it, or particularly fair. The sense of unfairness is further highlighted by the fact that, more than likely, Jesus' hearers would have mostly related to the third servant, the one called worthless. The society of Jesus' day, perhaps at least as much as our own, was a culture of haves and have-nots. And Jesus' followers tended to be of the poorer classes. They were people who did not trust wealthy landowners and certainly didn't trust the banking system such that it was in that day. Then, as now, the banking investment system was mostly the friend only of those who had some measure of wealth. Frankly, hiding one's money in a hole would have been considered a legitimate means of safeguarding modest resources, most especially resources that do not belong to oneself. But chances are, hiding money in the ground was something many of Jesus' audience had probably done themselves. And with that thought, the poorer classes listening to Jesus' parable might well have resonated with a statement, what everyone who has 
more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what little he has will be taken away, which is, after all, nothing more in meaning than the modern aphorism, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We might make, I believe, a defensible case for the fact that the parable is not at all about advice for managing one's sundry gifts, but rather it is an urgent warning or even a prediction about the ways of the world as we approach the end of an epoch. If you know how to finesse the system, if you can use money to get even more money, you will be further rewarded. In fact, the world will reward you in direct proportion to how much you make. But if you don't have that ability, if you can't somehow figure it out, it's likely that even what little you have will be taken from you and given to the ones who have the most. Take the one talent away from him, reads our parable, and give it to the one who has ten, so he has even more abundance. It sounds a lot like, let's give tax breaks to the largest and most successful corporations. Are they not the ones adding to the overall economy? Let's keep those tax shelter loopholes. Those who've earned the most certainly deserve to keep what they've got, don't they? It is possible Jesus is describing the level of greed that frequently accompanies the end of the age, the end of every age. History teaches that the fall of any particular empire is often preceded by a period of pronounced greed and social disparity. Consider the fall of Rome or Tsarist Russia or the pre-revolutionary French court. Indeed, let them eat cake. It is possible in this parable, the master is not God at all, but rather the powers of the world. And the parable is warning us of the greed and inherent social violence to come. And if that is the case, the one who truly has so little, and that little ultimately taken away as he is cast into the place of darkness and weeping, gnashing of teeth, is in fact Jesus the Christ. For Jesus, you will recall, was born in a stable and carried out his ministry mostly among the poor and the outcast with a group of decidedly misfit followers until he was accused of insurrection, tried in the mockery of legal proceeding, and condemned to a shameful criminal's execution, and finally buried in a borrowed grave. Inasmuch as this parable is, or might be, a warning of the violence and profound selfishness to come, it is also a statement of fact, a beacon of hope, that Jesus will be found among those who have had what little they possess taken away and given to those who have much. Jesus will be found in the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, where he will overcome even the deepest darkness with his eternal marvelous light. And so we too may be, even in the midst of darkness, become bringers of light to all those who have been cast out. Such diametrically opposed interpretations. Which is it? Can it be both? Can it be that it may change from situation to situation and person to person? And that would bring us to the third and final interpretation I would like to share with you. If indeed the Master is presumed to be God, and I suppose we tend to be more comfortable with that idea, then what of this third lazy servant? Why doesn't the Master show more compassion. After all, what he did, or didn't do, was it really all that bad? 
And in the case of this interpretation, I would like to suggest the story is not a blueprint for what shall happen or what we should even be about, but simply about our relationship to God and the way in which we live it out. All three servants, it turns out, have the same master. Each one is given, we are told, according to his particular ability. But only one servant acts, as it were, out of fear. Fear that the master is a harsh man, reaping where he does not sow, and gathering where he did not place grain. But the other two act boldly, willingly taking risks with what they know is not really theirs to begin with. The third servant imagines a master who is harsh and will be angry with a loss, and so acts accordingly and fearfully. In the end, the master he gets is the master he imagines. A significant portion of Jesus' teaching centers around the idea that God, his Abba, is not the God of human morality and endless rules. God is not the God of punishment or severity, but rather the God of grace and perfect love, love which casts out all fear. We choose to remain connected to the fearsome, angry God of our own societal or individual imaginings, then all we can perceive, all we see and feel and realize is in fact that fearsome God. We never have a chance to make the acquaintance of the one in whom there is no darkness. And so we find ourselves permanently mired in a darkness, not of God's creation, but of our own. So many possibilities for interpretation, so many possibilities for learning. And once our imaginations are released and running, I'm sure we might be inspired to find even more. But I believe what rings true in all of this is that Jesus is calling us urgently to learn about the God of peace, the God of love, who desires that we stand for his kingdom, that we take risks for his kingdom, a place where there will be no more outer darkness, where no one is ever cast out, and the children of light live in love and profound spiritual abundance. Mm -hmm.